Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. So glad you can join me today. Uh, it's uh, Listen, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you can find us on just about every podcast platform that's out there. You can go and subscribe if you're listening to us on one of those fine podcast platforms. You can also watch us on YouTube. You're going to want to watch today's show especially. Um, And please leave us a like, leave us a review, and let everybody in your world, in your orbit, know about the Federal Newswire's Lunch Hour podcast. Uh, Joining me today, I'm so excited to have her on. She's a, a longtime friend who I was able to get Reconnected with at a recent conference, and, and I, I said I have to have to absolutely have her on. Her name is Stacy Washington. Uh, she is the host of Stacy on the Right, which is on Sirius XM. She's also been affiliated with our good friends at Project Twenty One at the National Center for Policy Research, mm-hmm. Public Policy Research. She's a wife and mom of three fantastic kids, an Emmy-nominated television personality, and an Air Force veteran as well. So we have that in common because my wife is an Air Force vet, Stacy. Uh, She's also a former elected school board member. She's appeared on television around the world and published articles in countless newspapers, magazines, and websites. A passionate defender of gun rights, Stacey was named the Second Amendment Foundation's Journalist of the Year in 2018 and was on the cover of the July 2017 issue of NRA's America's First Freedom magazine. She's the daughter of an Army police officer and budget analyst. She spent the majority of her childhood growing up in Germany. She's traveled all around the world, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Spain, Switzerland, Austria, France, England, and the Netherlands. And let me start here, Stacey. Uh, where in Germany were you Were you living when you were growing up over there? Uh, it was pretty cool. We were at Hahn Air Force Base and also Darmstadt. And I graduated from high school from Mannheim American High School. Um, and we traveled all over Germany. And I miss it really badly. You know, it's interesting. So my wife and my sister-in-law both went to school over there. My wife's parents lived in Germany for eight years. And, and my, um, my, uh, 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 my sister-in-law graduated from... Uh, H.H. Uh, H. Arnold High School in Wiesbaden. Oh, that's um, where my sister graduated. My they're, sister they're, graduated from there. Yeah, my parents they, you were know, stationed there we should by then. F- figure out if they know each other because that would they that, probably they, do. May, they probably do. There's a, yeah. a really great alumni group. Well, let me ask you this: How did growing up, spending so much time in Europe, growing up, inform who you are as a person, but also your political beliefs? Well, I I have to say, I was just talking about visiting Berg Hohenzollern back in, uh, let's see, 2006, I think it was. My husband and I took the kids to Germany and stayed for about 10 days because my sister was stationed in Stuttgart at the SI Suites as a federal employee. She still works for the federal government. And she was there for six months. And so we went to visit her, you know, and we went to see some castles and visited some of my childhood haunts. And I got to show my husband those things. And it was really cool. But that's the last time I've been. Um, The last trip out of the country I had was to Switzerland. Switzerland, and we did not get to stop in Germany at all. So I was kind of disappointed by that. But I grew up reading the Stars and Stripes every morning before school. I would have my cereal and the Stars and Stripes would get delivered at like 3 a.m. And it would always be on the table already by the time I got up to go to school. And my dad would read it first and he always left at 6.30. So I would see it there and I'd be reading it first. I'd start with the cartoons, right? The comic strips. And then I would go through and read. I would even check the price of gold because it had the price of gold and silver every day Mm. in the Stars and Stripes. And so I grew up having kind of a, a view of the world from the military's perspective and from the geopolitics of the United States, what we were doing, what we needed, who we are, um, our interests around the globe, and looking at it from the perspective of, you know, the people who are doing these things overseas uh, on the ground, these troops, they're my friend's parents. They're they're my dad. They're, you know, this one's mom, this one's aunt and uncle, because we are all of us kids. Our parents are, are on active duty. And my dad was army, so I didn't have the posh, you know, it, it wasn't bad, but it was not posh like the Air Force. I joined the Air Force <laughs> because my dad said, you belong in the Air Force. You do not belong in the army. The facilities are better. They'll treat you better as a woman if you go into the Air Force. So yeah. I grew up just seeing the world through that lens and listening to Bobby Batista and Lynn Vaughn, watching them in the mornings. Sometimes I have enough time to turn on CNN because that was one of the channels that you could get on base overseas. 
And I would watch Lynn Vaughn and Bobby Batista. They were on 24 hours a day. It seemed, I don't know when they slept, the two of them. Um, but I could still hear James Earl Joy- Jones's voice say, this is CNN. Sure. And then she'd say, I'm Lynn Vaughn. And the other one would say, and I'm Bobby Batista. Mm-hmm. And then they would start, you know, this one's broadcasting. He's This one's reporting live from Kuwait. And then they would sure. show the guy and he would have on like a flak vest and he'd be talking really loudly and it'd be right. windy. And so, yeah, it, I don't know if it, I don't think it made me conservative or Republican because back then our politics were what's, what's best for freedom, what's best for liberty, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, actually, let's talk about this because there's something that changed in the last 20 years, which is that politics in America used to stop at the water's edge. I would say 25 years that that we all, you know, we could have our battles in, you know, in America over domestic policy, but we would all come together, you know, given America's foreign policy. What do you think changed? I mean, you know, is it is it that we no longer believe? I have a sheer belief that America is the greatest nation on earth. Is it you know the the was it the two thousand election? Was it you know the the second Gulf War? What are your what are your thoughts here? It's all of that, but mainly it's the injection of Marxism and critical race theory that really has been there since before we coined those terms. Right. It's been there for at least thirty years. Oh yeah. Um, some of the things that we see in news stories. Do you ever get a flashback? Because I'm I'm Gen X, so I remember going to yes. Department of Defense schools, and uh, we we would have the same survey. I, there was a household information survey. Sure. And I took it every year. I, I took it at school, and it would ask me things about my parents, and I would get a little angry at it. I remember thinking to myself, I wonder who gets this. I even asked my teacher, "Does this go home to my parents?" And she said, no, it's completely confidential. I said, so you're not going to tell my parents? And she was like, <laughs> well, no, we're not. We're not. It's just your parents know you're taking this. We're not not going to tell your parents, right. but we're not going to tell your parents. We're not going to tell them. And, yeah. and I said, so are my parents, do my parents already know? And she was like, what? They don't know your answers, but they probably do know you're <laughs> taking this. So, you know, by the time you get home as a kid, unless something terrible happened to you, you forget about these things. So I right. remember it being weeks after that, maybe it was over the summer. And my mom said something and I said, do you, do you believe you're a Democrat or a Republican? And she said, why do you want to know that? I said, I just remember being asked that in a survey um, during school this year. Wow. And she said, by who? And I said, by it was who? a household information survey. She said, why didn't you tell me? I said, oh, I forgot. She said, why are you thinking about it now? I said, because you were just talking about the president. And then I thought, oh yeah, I answered. Cause she said, what did you answer? I, I said, I checked the box. I don't know because I wasn't sure if you were a Democrat Good or Republican. You. Yeah, and so, they, I mean, at least they had a box, I don't know, but that's how long ago these surveys have been given to children. Now, now they're much more aggressive. What's your sexuality? You know, do things, things, very invasive things like that. But they've been, they've been ramping up to this for at least 30 or 40 years. Well, yeah, I would, and I would submit that, you know, it, it goes back much, much further in terms of the Marxist implementation um, you know, how things have changed. I, I made this point at this event we were at, you know, that, that, and I've said this on this air before in other places that, you know, Nikita Khrushchev in 1962, he goes before the, uh, the United Nations General Assembly and he says, uh, it was reported as we will bury you. That's not what he said. He said, we will be at your funeral. And what he was promising was, that the, the Soviet Union was going to use the the things that we hold dear, the strengths of Western uh, 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 civil libertarianism, democracy, et cetera. He was going to use those things against us, and namely injecting this Marxist perspective into the schools and and serving to pull us apart. It's like you you and I, roughly the same age. I think you're a little younger than I am. But it's like I came to a lot of my values during the bicentennial. I was five years old in 1976. It shows you all how, how old I am. Um, and I was just getting, you know, fed all of this stuff about the Revolutionary War and about freedom and who we are as a people. But at the same time that was going on, there were teachers who were out there teaching students that the bicentennial was a celebration of rich white slaveholders who didn't want to pay their taxes. And and that's how it begins, isn't it? I mean, you've served on the school board. You know this. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Well, okay, so I do remember there being times in class where I would be angry at what the teacher was saying because it went directly against what I learned in Bible class, yeah. right? So I would I would be thinking, because 
the the big big epiphany for me was I, I decided I would not have anything to do with the sciences because my science teacher told me when I questioned the diagram at the back of my science book, it had all of these monkeys and then it had a man at the end. And I said, how does this fit in with the Bible description of how God created man and woman? And he said, well, the Bible is a fictional account. It's, you know, it's religious and this is science. And so everyone in the scientific community accepts this. And I said, so you're saying that if I don't believe I am evolved from a monkey, that I believe that God made me, that I'm not a part of the scientific community. And he said, no, it doesn't mean you're not a part of the community, but you need to, you know, get the scientific view. You need to accept that. That's what we're teaching in this class. That's what you'll be tested on. And he really, he didn't, he didn't go any further into it. He wasn't there for a philosophical discussion. And I decided in that moment that I wouldn't be a scientist because I couldn't tolerate the idea that we were just evolved monkeys. I'd seen planet of the apes. I was like, this is not <laughs> like, this, we are not, this is not the thing. Uh, we're not reverting back to monkeys. We're not monkeys. And I was really, I was ticked off that whole day. And my dad was on a mission out doing a bivouac. So he was gone for like 90 days because he was in the army. And my mom was at the time getting her master's degree. And so she was, you know, going to work all day and then three nights a week, she'd be in class until like 10 PM. So I never got to talk to her about it because of course, you know, the day of, I wanted to talk after that, I forgot about it, didn't bring it up again. Um, I know she would have said that's nonsense. God made us, we are not monkeys. And that would have been at the end of it. So I think it's, it's discouraging to kids who come from a biblical background to hear that the only acceptable answers are that. And we have all of our kids in STEM programming as, as for college. And they don't believe that we're evolved monkeys, but they have to answer questions where my daughter would, would text me images of their, um, their PowerPoint presentations in class in her freshman, um, she was a biology major with a minor yeah. in chemistry and psych. They would text us the pictures. She would, she would send it. All answers were evolution-based. You had to pick yeah. the correct evolution-based answer. There were no creation answers or anything else. So you asked about school board. I'll just nutshell it for you. Yeah. It's already so deeply there that if you want to make a change as a school board member, you need to have at least five board members and you need the, the superintendent and all of the superintendents of curriculum and instruction and everything else to make those changes. It's now so far gone. Parents can't really change that unless they take their kids out of that school. You know, it, it's interesting because, um, so I went to, as, as you know, I went to a, 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 a progressive, secular progressive high school. But, you know, from, from kindergarten through ninth grade, I was in the public schools. And when I was in ninth grade, my school district went through a whole discussion. And my mom happened to be president of the school board at the time um, about issues, about uh, you know, honor systems, but what they call heterogeneous grouping versus homogeneous grouping. The idea that do you put all the kids together in a class regardless of their academic achievements and achievability, or do you segregate, I'm going to use that word, segregate them out based upon the, here are the higher achieving students, the faster learners, here are the average students, here are the slower learners. Um, and there was a huge debate. And it was really, again, the precursor to a lot of the debates that we have today, which is, you know, our school system happened to be one that that was very famous for having integrated very early on. Uh, it was a place where a lot of civil rights leaders had Vernon Jordan, who I'm sure you know who he is. Vernon Jordan brought his family there. There were others who brought their, his family there. Anyway, the point is, you had this very progressive high school that had come full circle. Our school system had come full circle, did not want to change. And so when they went with the uh, heterogeneous grouping determination because they didn't want to deal with accusations of racism to which I pointed out to a, a, a friend of mine who was black. I said, you know, how, how is this not racism for you to think that your, you know, that your friends and family members can't achieve? I mean, this is the, I didn't use the phrase soft bigotry of low expectations, mm -hmm. but that's, I guess I didn't know that phrase, but that's, that's what I was thinking. That's and sure enough, people began to pull their kids out of the schools and the schools a year, no joke, uh, uh, Stacy, like, a year, if if not two years, certainly a year later, the school started. The school system went into panic mode. Why are why are parents pulling their kids out of the school system? We don't understand what's going on here. And the school system still hasn't recovered, by the way. In an area in which they're surrounded by um, three of the highest achieving school districts, not just in the state of New York but in the country, this is like a sea of of uh, of, of mediocrity in terms of the schools. But you're right. I mean that was that was almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago, 
you know, 35 years later or 30 years later, this is what you're talking about, isn't it, Stacey, with, with regards to school policy? It is. And I can tell you from when our, so we were in, uh, it's either number one or number two, depending on the year, school district in the state of Missouri. And it's a boutique school district. It's very small in comparison to some of the larger suburban districts where you have, you know, the largest concentration of two parent households with college educations. That school district is actually yeah. to the west of where we were. And um, the subject came up. And so it wasn't something that they were discussing with the parents openly, but we parents noticed because all of us knew whose children were in talented and gifted. All of us knew it's, it was called idea lab at the time. Talented yes. and gifted is the name I had when I was a kid. That's when and we were so kids. That we, was a Gen X thing. Yeah. G -G 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 -G, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we, I, all of us parents knew because as soon as your daughter or your son took the test and was inducted in, they would start going and doing these extra things during school right. day. And the other kids would see them leave and they would ask where are they going? And they'd say, Oh, they're going to idea lab. So everybody knew. So one year I made a note of how much faster my daughter's class moved. She was in class with just the mix of the, the, the you know, luck of the draw. She was in a classroom. I might've been second or third grade with three or four of the kids from idea lab. And this is my older daughter who I kind of felt like because she was a bad test taker, she didn't make it into idea lab, but I kind of felt she had the intelligence to get in there, but it was neither here nor there. She didn't make it in. And in that classroom, because those kids were so sharp and so quick, the curriculum moved along at a much faster clip. She used to come home and say, this is what we did today. And I'm like, wow, you got through all this today? She's like, yeah, and it was so fun. We never had a minute off and we were there. And I'm like, wow. So then I mentioned that to a mom who was asking me how Maya was doing with this teacher because it was a teacher that, you know, some people didn't get along with this woman. Sure. And I was like, I get along with her fine because on day one, I went in and I said, if you're having trouble with Maya, you let me know Absolutely. and this is if you get any of my kids if it's a washington last name you let me know <laughs> what's going on and you and i we're, we're going to come to a meeting of the minds you will not have that problem on long term right. and she said okay you know so she this wasn't a, a huggy soft teacher we'd had so many of those in that building great great school but the long and the short of it is that mom was upset because her child was not getting that same experience and she said you need to make sure that the idea lab kids are spread throughout the classroom mix so that everyone can have the same experience. Yeah. And I was really bothered by that because instead of her saying, I, you know, I, I need to figure out how to make my child's experience much better. She's right. trying to downgrade the experience of other parents. And that's the competitive nature of parents, especially in a high performing district like that one. But I can tell you parents who have high performing kids want their kids in a classroom with other high performing kids so they can move fast. Right. The kids want to move fast. The kids who are slower need a mix. They need some smart kids in the classroom to help keep the pace up, but it's not really fair to smart kids to make them be in a class with kids who are really slow for the benefit of the really slow kids. So I, I, I favor kind of having them on tracks because it's, it's to their benefit. The, the smart kids need, we need them. You and I have talked about the doctor shortage. How oh, many yeah. doctors don't we have because those kids were placed in classrooms where it moves so slow, they lost interest in education. Smart kids, when they get bored, they become behavior problems. And these kids are then lost in a system that doesn't address their needs. They need to skip a grade. They need to be mentally stimulated at all times. They need to be allowed to go at their own pace and maybe skip chapters or go through chapters at a faster rate than everyone else. We need to honor those kids' brain power because they're the ones who are going to be our Senator Rand Pauls, our doctors like your wife, people who are going to bring something to society that we really need. We're going to come back to the health care issue in a second, but I want to talk about something else that's just cropped up. Uh, we, where I live um, in, uh, in Virginia, we just had a school board member come under fire. And again, it's just like you, you know, with uh, keeping tabs. And you and I both know, right, the only true determinant of childhood education success, I mean, there's innate talent, but it's also the involvement of parents in that child's mm -hmm. education. The greater the involvement, yep. the more successful that kid's going to be. So member of the school board comes to a school board meeting and he is irate because he has found out, maybe he's not irate, he is concerned. Let's not ascribe anger to it. It's concerned. He is concerned because his fourth grade daughter has told him that in their fourth grade class, uh, she is being not left behind, but not being given adequate attention from her teacher because her teacher is spending 90% of his or her time dealing with kids, working with kids who do not speak English. And the school board member dared ask the question, A, how many kids do we have in the district for whom English is not their first language? And B, how many of them are not here legally, right? That, you know, th th we want to know what are, how our resources are being deployed here. And he was immediately accused of being a racist 
They jumped all over him. The school superintendent issued an apology. He was denounced. Uh, but I want to get your thoughts because this ties in a couple of different. I know you're interested in education policy, but I know you're also interested in the immigration issue. Talk about how these two tie, get tied together. Well, first of all, who's paying for the education in that school where that school board member is? He's probably an unpaid school board member. Right. I know in, in Florida, they get paid to be school board members. But yeah. in most states, you're, it's an unpaid elected position. Right. And um, so he's he's paying. He's also serving as a school board member. So he's kind of double dipping on the work side. And he's watching his child fall behind for an education he's paying for. So right. it's he has a valid question. And the reason they don't want to answer it is because the answer would upset the rest of the parents who hadn't realized their child is being neglected in the classroom or aren't realizing how much of their resource dollars are being reallocated to ESL programming, English as a second language. And it's not just ESL. At this point, we have so many people coming in from places where we don't have people who speak that language. We're talking about completely new language uh, right. forms that we're having to have some adult learn to communicate with these kids, to teach them English. And we require that because every child in America is entitled to an education paid for by you and me, Andrew, paid for yes. by you and me. So the question is a valid one. He's not a racist. That's a question that people ask when they're used to balancing budgets and being held accountable for spending. It's a great question. And he should have had the answer in front of that school board, in front of that community, so they could decide whether or not they want to do that. Those kids who don't speak English shouldn't be in the classroom with the kids who do speak English. That's an ESL classroom. Does it look racist if all of the Mexican kids or wherever they're from are in a classroom by themselves learning English? Might look racist to you, but it looks sensible to me because they all need to learn English. They get out of the class when they learn English. How about that? Well, the, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Because we used to have, you know, I'm not going to say in-school suspension because we didn't have in-school suspension. We just had suspension. The concept yep. of in-school suspension. Us too. Yeah. So, but the point is, you know, you, but you would have, you would have sort of the specialized classes or you'd have summer school. Uh, you know, we had the, the technical training school where mm. in our school we're all the, I'm going to say this, I'm friends with many of them on social media today. They've become fine, uh, upstanding citizens. And frankly, not everybody should go to college and needs to go sure. to college, et cetera, to live full yeah. lives. But the burnouts. You know, the kids who the kids who would it, it'd be in that 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 space outside uh, between the second floor corridor and the gym, because uh, we had a very weird sort of hilly campus. Uh, the burnouts would go to the, 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 the technical school, the alternative. I think it was called the A school, the alternative school. Right. We would have those things. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am casting a stigma on them because I knew they were going to the A school. But again, it's let me ask you this. I'm sorry. Let me frame it here. I don't think I said this over the weekend. I have a, a phrase that I use. It, it's the most well-intentioned policies eventually bump up against very real realities, which I like. It means reality is always going to intrude. My father, he refined it. He said, there are many roads to utopia. However, all must traverse the surface of the earth. You know, we have to, we have to deal with the reality of a situation. You know, these other things be darned. What are your what are your thoughts on this? Well, I won't wax poetic, but I will say because I'm just somebody's mom on the radio or podcast or wherever I am. And the view of the world that I have is very much impacted by the bottom line. Um, I, I, I look at time as a finite resource. Yes. And so when when I look at my kids, you know, their their opportunities in school. Time out. Hold on. Time out. You may be the first guess to use that phrase. And it's one that I use all the time. Fire. Uh, time is the fire in which we all burn. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Sorry. To interrupt. Yeah. No, I, I like that even better. That's that's yeah. much more uh, that's much more romantically inclined. Time is a fire. In Thank which you, we all Star burn. Trek. True. True. Oh, and, you know, I love a sci fi reference. I'm a yeah. I'm yes. a Star Trek crazed individual. I. I, at one point, I was on the, online and I stumbled onto a blogger who had a house that I really liked. This is before you got all this information off of Instagram. Yeah. And I started going to her blog frequently. And she had a post one time that I literally, I just sat at my, my table in the dining room with my laptop and I cried. She said, 18 summers, 18 summers, that's all you get. And then she went on to talk about, you know, cooking soup in the kitchen with the youngest one in college. And she's making a pot of soup for two people. And it's such a tiny pot. And so she tried making the same size pot for the family of five and giving the soup away, but not everybody loves your soup and it's a waste of energy and food. And why are you cooking for other people? And so it's not, it's not this, like, it's not something that she would give a Pulitzer prize to for the writing, but it was emotionally connective because 
we mothers are so, it, the kids are literally on oh, our yeah. brain, their brain cells, their, their physical cells go into our brain and sit there for the rest of our lives. Once we've been pregnant with them, it's, it's an wow. amazing phenomenon. It's when I say our kids are on our minds as women, it's not actually a euphemism. It's right. real. They now know that those cells come out of the baby, go up through the umbilical cord and travel into the mother's brain and sit there. It's the reason why yes. I think about my kids multiple times every day. And so uh, when you, when I read that, I thought to myself, I already was trying to maximize every moment with them, maximize their experiences, maximize my impact on their discipleship and their indoctrination. I write about that in my book, that it's your job to indoctrinate your own kids. If other people are indoctrinating them, it's because you're letting them. And so I, I made up my mind in that moment that I would redouble my efforts, even though I still had years left with my kids, because I didn't want to be standing in front of my stove, stirring a pot of soup, crying into it, right. regretting not having taken the advantage of the time. And so I, I share that to say, we should be obsessed with our kids. We should be at school board meetings asking why money is being spent on other people's kids. You, right. you should demand that your child gets all of the attention that you're paying for. If they don't get it, you should take your child out and put them somewhere where they will get it. If, they, if you can't find a place to give it to them, you should teach them yourself. You don't have to be a PhD or an MBA like my husband to teach kids at home. You just have to be interested in their education and have some kind of a plan. So I, you know, when you think about time, it really is a finite resource and it really is something that we're fighting against, but it's also to our benefit if we use it wisely. And so with right. our children, because they're going to be managing our lives, we're going to be in the old folks home or <laughs> McKnight place in the high rise where the rich folks go buy a condo after they sell their, their, you know, their forever home. We're yeah. going to be in there and our kids are going to be running this place. Do you want your kids to be running this place where they had a third rate education because all the English language learners got all the time? No, right. you want your kid to be a brilliant mastermind of deductive reasoning, logical thought, rhetoric, everything. You want them to be able to manage this place because look at it. I mean, just yeah. take a look around this place. <laughs> Even the worst of this place is the best on the planet. I've been yeah, all yeah. over. I've been all over the world. I've been to Russia back when it was the USSR. I've been to some pretty amazing, beautiful places. And I remember them. And they went into my spirit and they changed me. But this is the only place on the planet I want right. to live full time. And this is my home and I have it in my bloodstream, America. And we need to have kids who can take care of it. I don't want to give it to them and they can't, and they can't handle it. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, that's to me, you know, now that my older one is about ready to launch and I, you and I have talked about this over the weekend, the fact yeah. that she has a job is just amazing, but also the right, the fact she's only going to be a couple hours away for me yeah. is, is, is fantastic. And, you know, to me, I still get lots of, Lots of time with our younger one. Uh, I wound up spending the other day uh, with her, helping her noodle through some 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 stuff. But let's talk about this. You know, you're you. You're, let's talk about in two parts. And I'm not even sure where to how to how to begin this. But folks, you know, when Stacy and I were at this event recently, we started talking about uh, healthcare issues, and and we were talking about how we how we frame problems, and um and and she and I both were talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the supply of doctors in America. Um, your daughter, your, 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 one of your daughters is, is the at oldest. medical school. Your oldest mm -hmm. one's in med school now, but this was a, a tough journey. And you and I both came to the same conclusion about the fact that really any kid who has the aptitude, who wants to become a doctor should become a doctor. Tell us more. Well, I just watched her go through the process and I said, I can never make it through this. And my husband said, yes, you could. You're intelligent enough to be a doctor and you could go to medical school. And I said, yeah, you, you, you see that intelligence. That's what you're saying. But I'm talking about the step-by-step -step process right. by which she had to do undergrad, take certain classes. She, she was really meticulous about this from day one, even though she started out as a veterinarian major, she was going to do okay. veterinarian medicine and she switched from that sophomore year. So it's still pre-med you, either one of those you're doing pre-med, but she decided she would work with humans because number one, you get paid more. And number two, um, she, she, there's not much you can do with dogs. I mean, there's only a few surgeries you can do with them. Right. It's really the same thing as you're inoculating them as a vet and you're maybe, you know, maybe you're putting an IV in a dog or, sure. you know, taking out its teeth or something. So she changed majors. And then from there, she kind of just made out a plan for herself and executed on that. Now, Andrew, I'm not talking about just getting out of undergrad. I'm talking about also then, you know, you have to take the MCAT. You have to study for the MCAT for four months. Usually oh, yeah. if people choose the four month option, you're doing 10 hours a day, six, seven days a week of studying for the MCAT. 
She did that and took it twice and then got the score she wanted the second time. She also took a gap year and a half, worked as a scribe, worked in an optometrist's office. She did write some papers and one internship she did over the summer at Wash U. I mean, she's, she's published and research. She did some pretty cool things in the AURE program over, over at her college and undergrad. And so she did all of this stuff, still not outside of the reasonability, but then it was the application process for medical school and writing the secondaries, which she had to basically, she created a, like this huge matrix for it so that she didn't have to answer the same question twice. And also so that she could make sure that her answers were appropriate to the individual secondary from the individual college, sure. the research on the colleges, and then waiting to hear back. And then the process of denying all of the others so you can pick one. I, I'm, I'm saying it's too complex. And also it not in not in a needed way. So I understand right. the complexity for some parts of it, but for the process of getting into it, it's too complex. And then the other thing is, it goes back to what we've already discussed, Andrew. In education, especially with human children, you have these opportunities, there are touch points where these kids are going to go one way or the other. Right. And that's usually grammar school. If they leave the fourth grade without having a solid, proficient or advanced grip on reading and math. And right. really, you know, thought too. They need to they need to know how to think. Then those kids are gonna go they're by eighth grade, they're not even going to be interested in finishing their high school education. Right. And they won't be in algebra, algebra one in eighth grade, which is we're almost destroying that metric. Oregon and California right. no longer require kids to have a full math education because you know, black kids can't do it, which is bull crap. They they were working on bull that crap. in Virginia as well, but yeah. Unbelievable because those kids are getting robbed because some of them, right. they just need a little tutoring and they can totally do trigonometry and calculus one and two right. and three and four. They can do it. So I'm, I'm, first of all, there is no limit to what a child can do if the parents are determined and willing to spend the time. And we don't have to go to India for all of our doctors. We can grow them right yes. here at home. They're already here. Um, and then as far as the healthcare policy, I want to see one of the plans over at Heritage for healthcare reform describes Americans being able to get together in groups of thousands, tens of thousands, and create their own group and then approach United Healthcare and say, here's how many people we have in the group, here's sure. what we're submitting, and you work through the process of getting health insurance that way. So it's not employer based. That's what I want to see as a reform because it's so hard if you if you get laid off, right? No fault of your own. It's a tech bubble. You get laid off, you're really it, Cobra is not not great. Cobra is supposed to be the the fix, and it's right. not a fix at all. I, I remember having this conversation. I, I you know working on on the healthcare issue, you know the previous to the Affordable Care Act. So we're talking mm -hmm. in 2011. I was going around the country talking to groups of people, and I went to a uh, a small business group in uh, actually it may very well have been just outside of St. Louis, um, and someone said to me. Uh, how about decoupling insurance from uh, from employer? Yeah. And like I, I hadn't thought about that before. And and it, all kinds of possibilities. As you and I talked about, to me, it's not about the insurance side of it. It's about the healthcare provision side. We need to be doing what we can to create more doctors, nurses, and physicians assistants. Mm -hmm. But at the very, you know, and it's funny because I know that for a long time when we were living in Maryland. You know, my wife's dream job was she wanted she wanted to become the the family doctor for our church and maybe a handful of churches in the area, uh, right? You know, get the churches to band together and sort of you have an almost like a concierge practice, hmm. uh, but you do it just for that you know small subset. So you're really practicing medicine within the community uh, in in which you're living. Yes. Um, that's 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 part of the reason why she became a, a a family doc. But let's let's go here because you were saying, and I we didn't really get the details. You and your husband have something really interesting going on with with this. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, okay, so we originally started a healthcare sharing organization because we have a child who has a it's. It's not a true rare disease. True rare diseases are the ones where you know one in you, you're one out of four people in the entire world who has it. But um, one of the rarer diseases is Crohn's disease, and one of our okay. children has that, and um, he has to have a infusion every five weeks. And so he's wow. had a very burdensome journey with it. Um, the infusion itself used to be twenty thousand a month. It's now no longer as new. So the newer ones are twenty thousand a month, and his is dropped down to about. 10,000 a month, I think. Wow. And that's 10,000 every five weeks, I should say. And so, um, but that's a hundred thousand dollars a year at, at least because that yeah. doesn't include the home health aide who comes oh, yeah. to the house and administers the infusion. Sure. And there are some doctor's visits that are involved in, in, um, mm. you know, basically your 
blood work every so often, et cetera. There's just, it's a whole suite of things wow. that goes with the infusion. And so this is what keeps him alive. And um, if anything goes wrong with it, it's surgery and you have to have parts of your intestines mm. removed. And he's already yeah. had that surgery, which you Oof. know that's pretty common for Crohn's sufferers to have it in their early 20s. And so uh, we, we started a healthcare sharing organization. Now it did not take off. I advertised, we did all, all kinds of cool things and it didn't take off. But out of that work, we began to partner with an organization called Sharks, who actually does drug negotiation for employer groups. Mm. And they help people access their medications for a much cheaper price than what you and I pay when we go to CVS or Walgreens. And what we did was we set up a foundation product with them that helps employees like my son. What happens is the employer group has an individual plan with Aetna or United Healthcare or whoever. They'll get one employee will get canceled because their medication for the rare drug is 120,000 a month, right? right? Not, not a year, a month. Wow. And so they're skewing the entire um, health insurance group. The, the cost of it is getting skewed by this one person. So the insurer will boot that one person off. Well, the employer doesn't want to lose their employee. They have to honor their agreement to provide health insurance. And so what we do is we find them a plan that will cover their drug. We negotiate with the drug maker or get a patient assistance program if we need to. And this employee now is receiving this, uh, it's free to them because we donate this to them. We give them an annual grant and it's renewable wow. every single year. And all they have to do is just, you know, help us get paperwork and stuff done and deal with their insurer and also uh, possibly wherever they're getting the drug. Sometimes we go to a small pharmacist. Sometimes we have to go out of the country to Canada. But what we do is we help them to make sure they can have health insurance because they're working. They can't yeah. do this on, they don't have the time to do this research. So we do it. And it's a, a donor funded program. And, and we really love helping these people. They're cool people. They're regular people who just happen to have like my son Crohn's and right. so many others have these diseases and they just need help getting access to their drugs so they can keep working and earning a living and paying a mortgage and, you know, doing the stuff we all do that we have to do. We have to clean up, we have to clean our bathrooms, hmm. get the car cleaned. You know, we, we have stuff to oh, do. Yeah. We don't have time to do this. So we do that. Um, my husband runs that it's the lifeline program, but it's under That's our Shanghai ministries, not for profit. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with it. And, and folks need to be looking at this as a model to be replicated elsewhere. I mean, that's, you know, and that's the thing is we need to be innovative in terms of how we approach these, approach solutions to these problems, don't we? Yeah. And with us, we stumbled onto this need through starting the health share. So the health yeah. share didn't work out, but this is actually a very needed program. And it's something that other not-for-profits do. We're not the only not-for-profit that does this. But we are serving a very particular group of employer groups and, and yeah. their employees who have this need. And the numbers just keep ramping up because health insurers have a lot of costs, but they also take in an amazing amount of money, which you know, because this is an area that you have become an expert in as well. Yeah. There's so much money in it. And so, you know, without the, the, the person like you and I shouldn't have such a struggle accessing healthcare in America right. because there's so much money there. And we shouldn't be paying twenty eight hundred a month for Cobra if we lose our job and we need to continue our health insurance. We sh this should not be. And so we need private organizations to step in and to make it work because the government, I don't think they're ever going to do it. No, and, and well, right, because there's nothing gained by solving the problem unless it serves to put more and more people on the government's insurance dole, right, to get them more into government run insurance. And we all know that's that that's a non-starter. I was remiss, Stacey, in that I did not reference your book at the top of the show. Tell us about oh. the book. Uh, the, the book is Eternally Cancel Proof. And in it, I talk about a lot of different things, but it's Eternally Cancel Proof because um, I had someone ask me years and years and years ago when I was doing terrestrial radio once a week, 97.1. And I'd said some very pointed things about immigration and I'd had a couple of angry callers who called in. And after it got done, you know, kind of getting my butt chewed out by these angry callers, mm -hmm. I was laughing and, you know, going on about my life. And someone sent me a message, an email and said, I, I hear you on the radio and either you're on something or you've got a secret because you are unfazed by these people. Sometimes they call in and they hate you. You, you said you've gotten hate mail. I, I had, when I was on terrestrial radio, I used to get people who I, I would literally turn their information over to law enforcement to have them yeah. take a look at it. Cause it was, you know, they were that bad. And I told them that I know where my eternity is going to be spent. And so therefore I fear no man. Now, sure. obviously back then when I made that statement, I hadn't seen the cancellation of a president, right? Mm -hmm. His removal from social media, lawfare launched against him. Some of his cohorts are now in jail for stuff right. that Democrats do every day. 
So it, it is really serious having that outlook, but it's also a recognition of the God that I serve who is mighty, unstoppable, and undefeated. Yeah. He's the only person we can say is undefeated is God. So if yeah. I know where my eternity is, then I can live more freely here on this earth. And the book covers, we cover uh, critical race theory, true black history, the two party platforms. I talk about indoctrinating your own kids in education. And I share some stories. I got canceled from the Post-Dispatch as a writer. I got canceled from Christian radio just because, you know, programming change. You learn about that five minutes before your show is over on a Thursday. Um, it's 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 the kind of stuff you have to survive, right? You, I know you yeah. have a, a very good uh, cancellation oh, yeah. story yourself. So oh, yeah. you, you survive it. But my question is, as a Christian, do you survive it with a sour face? Do you come out of it with wrinkles and gray hair looking crazy? Or do you come out of it with an enviable uh, looking family there? I'm telling you, if you guys haven't seen the, the daughters, they're gorgeous daughters. I, I got yes. to meet one and the other one has the cutest picture, cutest, yeah. cutest ever. And he's married to a doctor. You're like Ben Shapiro. He also is Air Force to a doctor. doctor. For yeah. Air Force doctor. So great. Yeah. So, so fantastic. So you come out of these things and people try to cancel you. They try the Dickens to rob you of your joy and your right. accomplishments and your purpose. And you come out of that and you just say, you know what? I'm getting back up and I'm going to keep going just like you've done, just like I've done. And so the, the overarching theme of the book is not being canceled, but in it, I cover things that Christians want their pastors to preach about. And I cover the biblical worldview. And so it's a lot of like, it's meaty, but it's also a weekend read. It's a couple hundred yeah. pages, 216 pages. You can get through it on two plane rides or a weekend, and then you can save it and use little bits of it to smack down the left. Here, here. They're constantly sharing things that are untrue, Andrew. So. Well, and that's and that's just it. As as my friend uh, and colleague here at the Federal Newswire, Jerry Rogers said, you you have to find uh, find the truth, plant your feet, and stand firm. The title mm -hmm. of the book again, Stacey Washington, is "Eternally Cancel Proof: A Guide for Courageous Christians Navigating the Political Battlefront." Eternally Cancel Proof. So we can find you on Sirius XM Monday through pr Friday, nine a.m. to midnight every day. Nine p.m. Uh, to all midnight. What? I'm sorry. 9 p.m. to midnight, not 9 a.m. Yeah. to midnight. That would be a really, really long day. <laughs> a really <show>. long day. <laughs> yeah. But you're also, and you're also doing TV for Salem or yes, not anymore. And yes. I yeah. am. It's 5 p.m. every day, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern on Salem News Channel. You can download the SNC app onto your smart television, or you can just go to SalemNewsChannel.com and watch. Um, it's it's fun. We uh, Today I covered all about Balmoral Castle will be wow. open. It's going to be open for three months this summer. And if you can get yourself to England, it's $190 if you want to go through Balmoral Castle in a group wow. of 10 and have tea. It's $190 okay. bucks per person. Now, well, I don't know if the, I'm going to be able to make it. Yeah, I, is the tea included yeah. or is it? Uh, the tea is the tea is one ninety. If you're just going through without you know, the tea, like, it's like one twenty. Given the yeah. amount of tea that you and me and Kira Davis uh, uh, spilled over the weekend, we should uh, we should make the, the can trip we not over go? there. Can we not get together and go? Can we can <laughs> yes. we banish racism and go? We, I want to go. We should find find a way to do that. Well, <laughs> Stacey Washington, thank you so very much for joining us uh, this week on the lunch hour. Thank you so much. Fun to have a lunch hour chat with you. Thanks. Always, Andrew. always good. Well, this has been uh, yet another episode of the Lunch Hour Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. If you are listening to us on one of the many podcast platforms where you can find us, check us out uh, um, uh, on, uh, on YouTube if you're watching us. As I said, I'm Andrew Langer. And please enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream.